Good morning. We'll give everybody a chance to log in and get set up. We just have about another minute. Everybody doing good? Sure to type your name in the chat. Thanks, Tessa. Okay. So, oops. it's eight o'clock, we're gonna go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at chapter nine, which covers motivation and emotion. So I told you guys at the beginning of class, when we're looking at psychology, like throughout the entire semester, we are going to be looking at why we do what we do. Um, so today we actually get, get into that even more specifically because we're looking at motivation. So we look at motivation. Motivation is, as you can see on the screen, the process by which activities are started, directed, and continued so that physical or psychological needs or wants are met. So, you know, what made it motivated you to get up and come to class today you know is it is it some of you may be motivated to come to class because your parents tell you to you know you're going to get punished maybe your coaches make you come to class because if you don't you have to run extra heels or something like that so if we are looking at that sort of motivation like coming to class because you are trying to avoid some type of outside punishment um, from your parents or your coaches or something of that nature, that is called extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is from the outside. It's whenever you do something for an external reward or to avoid an external punishment. The opposite of external motivation where extrinsic motivation is intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is when you do something for an internal reward because it's fun, because it's satisfying, or maybe because it's even challenging. Um, I was looking at, you know, I think I've told you guys that I'm gonna be taking some classes starting in January. <coughs> And I feel like I'm somewhat intrinsically motivated to go in and take these classes because I'm taking them because I genuinely want to learn more about the specific subject that I am looking at studying. So um, it's I, at this point, I don't see that these classes that I take are going to, you know, I'm not doing it so that I can get a better job necessarily or something of that nature. I am doing it simply so that I can um, learn more about the subject that I'm going to be studying. So that's more of an intrinsic motivation. So the studies actually have indicated that intrinsic motivation is much stronger than extrinsic motivation. So just keep that in mind um, when you think about why you do what you do. Are you doing it just for the sake of doing it because it's fun, challenging, or satisfying? Or are you doing it because of some type of external reward or avoidance of punishment? So we are going to look at some of the different theories of motivation. And the first theory that we want to look at has to do with instincts. So instincts are like biologically determined um, sets of behavior responses that we see in people and in animals, okay? So some of the, if we look at motivation as far as instincts are concerned, throughout history, 
people have been studying instincts. Um, let's see. The need, a need is something that we um, need, a primary need is something that we need for survival. Okay, I don't want to go there yet. I want to talk, sorry. So looking at instincts. So there are some instincts that that tend to be innate. These instincts include things like uh, aggressiveness or um, the instinct, sexual behavior tends to be instinctual um, in order to reproduce and procreate. Um, aggressiveness also tends to be an instinct. William McDougall actually proposed 18 different instincts. Another instinct that we might experience is gathering or acquisition. Sigmund Freud said that our instincts are going to reside in the id, part of our personality, where our basic needs are met. So this is not something that can actually be scientifically studied, however, um, if you will. So we just kind of go off the fact that we do have these various instincts. So let me ask you a question. Um, do any of you, I have my chat pulled up, do any of you have children? So I'm not seeing anybody saying yes, they have children. Um, you may have heard of the motherly instinct before. And I sometimes experience this with Casely. You know, when you just have a gut feeling or an instinct that something is wrong or, you know, with my daughter. So how are we going to scientifically prove that I had a feeling that Casely could have been in some type of trouble? There's really no way to do that. So the, in the instinct approaches cannot be scientifically proven. <laughs> So the drive reduction of motivation works off of our needs. A need is a requirement of something. So there are different types of needs. Primary needs are related to survival. So we need food, we need water, we need sleep. All of those things are related to survival. Secondary needs are, are um, associated with some type of primary need. Secondary needs would include like money. Money is a secondary need. Um, usually we go to work and we get money to buy food, which is a primary need. So needs, the drive reduction theory is going to work off of needs and drives. Drives include the psychological tension that you experience when you need to fulfill a need. So in other words, you're hungry. So that drive is that you're hungry, so you are going to go get food, which is the need to eat, to satisfy that drive, to reduce that tension that you are feeling. Um, and that would cause us to behave in a certain way. So you're hungry, you eat lunch. But I want you to keep in mind that we don't always just eat because we're hungry. There are many different social factors that arise um, when looking at food. Um, so I, this is when I might ask you, you know, what are some of the reasons that you eat? So I would be thinking Thanksgiving's coming up. Let's see if somebody. Hey, Derek. Thanksgiving is coming up and we all are going to eat. Hopefully, um, you know, if there's not too many stipulations on family, family gatherings, hopefully all get to experience some type of Thanksgiving dinner. So yes, we do need that food for nutrition to eat, but how many of you are going to go and eat a piece of pumpkin pie or a piece of pecan pie after you're already fully stuffed and full now that is going to not actually be part of the drive reduction theory. That's going to be part of an incentive approach. Um, the incentive approach to motivation says that things often are attractive to us or lure us to, 
to eat, you know, to do whatever. Uh, maybe just throwing this out there, you choose to go to a concert or something of that nature because the, the concert is an incentive. You are motivated or attracted to that particular band, so you go to that concert. So we also have to look at what is called the expectancy value theories when we are looking at incentive approaches to motivation. We, the expectancy value theory actually looks at the different values and expectations that each individual has when it comes to um, motivation. So for instance, let's say it's Thanksgiving and I'm eating Thanksgiving dinner and after dinner, we are, it's time for dessert. So I'm already stuffed full, so we know that we're not working off of a drive reduction theory. I don't need food for survival at that point. I simply want some dessert. So if I walked into the kitchen to get a piece of pie, if there was a piece of pumpkin pie, I'm going to pass on that. I am not going to eat that pumpkin pie because I don't put value into pumpkin pie. I don't like pumpkin pie. If there's a piece of pe pecan pie, I might get me a piece or two of pecan pie. So we have to look at our own values and our own expectations when it comes to the incentive approaches to motivation. But still, those are not the only, um, looking at instincts and drive reduction and incentives, those are not the only three theories to motivation. We can actually look at some other types of some other theories. Um, we can look at psychological needs. Okay, so these are three types of needs that have been proposed that, that, that we tend to psychologically have at different levels. These include the need for achievement. A need for achievement is, you know, whenever you really want to reach certain goals, um, that you, you know, for instance, okay, I think that I have a high need for achievement because I'm going back to school. I already have a master's degree. Why am I going back to school? Because I want to achieve something. I want to learn more about the specific topic that I'm looking at. So I, I want to achieve. Another need that we may experience psychologically is the need for affiliation, the need to be around other people. And of course, this is going to vary from person to person. Some people need to, you know, want that popularity, want to be affiliated with other people, need social interaction. And some people want to avoid interaction with other people at all costs. So, of course, these three needs are going to vary. The last psychological need that we look at is the need for power. This is a need to have control or influence over others. Some of you may feel like you have a high need for control. I actually do feel like I have a high need for control. I'm always, I, you know, I don't like to think of it as I have a need for power because that kind of sounds negative, but I do. I like to be in control of situations, you know, um, and things of that nature. So these three psychological needs are all needs that we may experience at different levels depending on who you are. Can look back to that expectancy value theory as well when we talk about that. Next, we look at the arousal approach to motivation. So the arousal theory says that we have a certain level of arousal that we like to maintain. And again, for each person that is different. We may like high arousal if we, um, how many of you, I mean, you don't have to talk or, or type in the chat, but just think about it yourself. How many of you like to go to amusement parks and, uh, and ride roller coasters or, you know, you're always wanting that type of stimulation? If you are that type of person, you may need a high need of arousal to function at, at your best. And um, these type of people are often called sensation seekers people that will go out and, and seek high levels of arousal. Some people function better at lower levels of arousal. Um, 
that these people aren't necessarily considered sensation seekers. It just means that they function at their optimum at a lower level of arousal. This is explained by the yerkes dodson law. Um, it says that too much motivation, too much arousal could cause you to choke. You've probably heard of that before. Um, I remember several years ago, if any of you guys are Major League Baseball fans, I was watching the Rangers one night, and um, you, Darvish, if you are a, a Rangers fan, you might remember who you, Darvish, was. He was pitching, and it was the ninth inning, and he had a um, perfect going. So no hits, no scores, anything. And I was, like, freaking out for him. And then all of a sudden, the, he pitched, and the, the batter hit the ball, and it just kind of rolled to back to you, Darvish. So all he would have had to have done is, you know, stop the ball, throw it to first, and he would continue his perfect game. Unfortunately, the ball rolled right between his legs, and his perfect, the guy got on base, and his perfect game was over. I would venture to say that he was experiencing a very high level of arousal at that time, and therefore he he choked. He just he couldn't perform a simple task because he was so aroused. We might think of that also as being stressed out. The Yerkes Dodson Law says that a high level of arousal is typically needed for easy tasks and a low level of arousal is typically needed for difficult tasks. For instance, if you are going in to perform brain surgery on an individual, you're not going to want to get pumped up to go do that. You know, you're not wanting to be like, oh yeah, I'm so pumped up, I'm ready to go in and perform this brain surgery because you need to stay calm and keep cool and go in and do your best at those little bitty difficult tasks, you know? So that's something to think about whenever looking at levels of arousal. So throughout um, the semester, we have been talking about Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow's theory is a little bit different than others, other people's theories. He actually said that we are motivated to act based on this hierarchy of needs. So if you look at it, on the bottom of the hierarchy are our physiological needs. So we are first and foremost motivated to survive. So we will look to satisfy our hunger, thirst, fatigue, things of that nature. Next, we want to satisfy our safety needs. So if we are alive, you know, physically alive, then we want to be safe. Next, we want to um, have love and belongingness. Then we move to our esteem needs. Um, we want to be competent. We want to gain approval from others. Next, we want to satisfy our cognitive needs, like to learn and to understand. Next, we want to satisfy our aesthetic needs, to appreciate symmetry, order, and beauty. And then lastly, he says that we strive to reach our full potential, which is called the self-actualizing tendency. You might remember that from our humanistic theories when we were talking about Carl Rogers. Um, so I'm going to talk about transcendence last. Okay, so say, you know, you're going through life and you want to satisfy the bottom needs first and work your way up the pyramid. Now, it's not one of these things where we start at the bottom, we get to the top, and we were there in life. Throughout your life, you may go up and down this pyramid several times. So let's say that we are functioning very highly at, at the top of the pyramid, and then a natural disaster hits, like a hurricane comes through, and we lose our house and everything that we physically own. So we're going to be knocked back down to the bottom of the pyramid where we want to first satisfy our physiological needs. We need food. We need to be surviving. So what, then we can start building our life back up to the top and hopefully reach our full potential, which is our self-actualizing tendency. Now, it's also important to remember that 
Each person's self-actualizing tendency is different. Um, each person's full potential is different because we have to look at the phenomenological perspective and understand that everybody is different. Um, later on, Abraham Maslow added transcendence to the top of the pyramid. Transcendence is if you've reached your full potential in life, if you are a self-actualized person, then you want to help others become self-actualized. And that is the top need on the pyramid, which is known as transcendence. But for all um, you know, purposes, I want you to think of self-actualization as the highest need on the pyramid. Okay, now we're going to switch gears and we are going to talk about emotion. We're going to talk about how we experience emotion. So what are the elements of emotion? When we experience an emotion, there are, I'm trying to find, can't find the slide that is going to tell us. So I want you to understand there are four parts to an emotion. The physiological response. So when we experience an emotion, our body experiences something physiologically, like our heart racing and things of that nature. A biological behavior, this will um, include, or a behavior, a physiological response, a behavior, which is going to include things like laughing, crying, our facial expressions, which we'll look at in just a second. We experience a subjective feeling, that is the labeling of the emotion, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm fearful, whatever. And then lastly, we look at the cognitive appraisal of the emotion. So our first few theories of emotion are going to look at three of the four parts of an emotion. But the first thing I want to introduce to you is how we express emotion. This would be the behavior part. And it also is going to coincide with that subjective feeling or the labeling of emotion. There are seven universal facial expressions for emotion. These seven universal facial expressions are going to include happiness, sadness, anger, fear, contempt, surprise, and disgust. So if you look at this picture, which only six of the seven are up there, if you look at these pictures, you can probably pick out which of those seven emotions these people are experiencing. So this is going to be anger, fear, disgust, happiness, surprise, and sadness. So the seventh one is contempt and it's not up there. So no matter what language you speak or culture that you're from, as you can see, um, these folks are obviously from various cultures. Um, you will express these emotions with universal facial expressions. So let's talk about how we experience an emotion. The first is the common sense theory of emotion. It says that we are going to experience a stimulus. Our first response is going to be a subjective feeling, such as fear, and then we have our physiological response, which is ANS or arousal. So I see a snarling dog, I'm afraid, so I'm shaking. That's common sense, that's what we mostly think about. But now we're going to have to go in and, and we are going to have to break down these emotions, okay? That's what we're going to do in just a second is break down what, what emotion coincides with the physiological responses and things like that. Another theory that is similar to the common sense theory of emotion is the facial feedback theory. I'm looking for it. The 
facial feedback theory is was introduced actually by Darwin. It says that the muscles in our face are going to send a message to our brain that tells us which emotion we are feeling. So if we're smiling, we're happy. If we're frowning, we're sad. I would venture to say that that's not necessarily true, okay? Because even you guys might not know what kind of mood I'm actually in this morning. I'm actually in a great mood, very happy today, but I could come to class and you could see my face and I could do a very good job of hiding if something had gone wrong this morning, you know, um, or whatever. So the facial feedback theory is actually a physiological theory of emotion. It says that our muscles in our face send a message to the brain that tells us how we feel. So in other words, we see a snarling dog, we have a physiological reaction and you know, fear on our face, and that facial expression actually leads to the labeling of the emotion or the subjective fear, the subjective feeling. So now let's go back and look at some other types of emotion, how we experience emotion. So the James Lang theory says that we, it's also similar to the facial feedback theory, it says that we are stimulated, our body is physiologically aroused, and it is that arousal, though that physiological response that is going to lead to the labeling of the emotion. So in other words, I'm afraid because I'm shaking. You get up to do a speech in front of, um, in front of your class, and you know, you're scared because you don't like to do that. It actually says that that scaredness, that fear, that scaredness, that fear that you are experiencing comes because your face is turning red, not necessarily because of the situation. Okay, so Canon Bard came in and said, wait a second, we have to look at how complex our body systems are and we can actually have messages sent to our brain from various parts of our body at the same time. So can, the Cannon-Bard theory says we are experiencing everything simultaneously. So we are stimulated here by the snarling dog. So there's activity going on that's outside of our awareness in our brain. And that activity is going to lead to the physiological response and the labeling of the emotion or fear at the same time. Okay, so if you want to know my personal opinion, I don't think that any of those make a lot of sense. Any of those theories make a lot of sense. What, do, what does make sense to me is when we bring in the cognitive appraisal of the situation. Okay, so Sasha and Singer did a study. And what they did was they got a group of people and separated them into two different groups. They put one group in a room with an angry person. Then they put another group in a room with a happy person. At first, what they had done was injected them with certain chemicals that caused physiological arousal. So all of both groups of people are experiencing the same physiological arousal, okay? So we are going to look at how each of these groups, group one with the angry person said they were angry. That's the labeling of the emotion, the subjective feeling. Group two with the happy person said that they were happy. That's the labeling of the emotion, the subjective feeling. Okay, so if we go back up to the James Lang theory, according to the James Lang theory, because they are all experiencing the same physiological response, then they should all be experiencing the same emotion, right? But they're not. <clears throat> so the Sasher and Singer study actually introduced cognitive appraisal to the situation. So they're all experiencing, they were the same physiological responses because of the chemical that was injected into their bodies. The first group of people appraised the situation as 
a fearful or angry situation. The second group of people appraise the situation as a happy situation. So the Sasher and Singer um, theory of cognitive arousal says that the cognitive appraisal is what actually leads to the labeling of the emotion or the subjective feeling. That makes a lot more sense to me. Lazarus came in and said, took it just a little bit further. He called his theory the cognitive mediational theory. So the cognitive and me mediational theory says not only does our cognitive appraisal determine the subjective feeling that we experience, but it determines the level of subjective feeling that we are experiencing. So if we look at it in this sense, so we're walking down the street, the sidewalk, and you see a snarling dog, okay? So you just have a little bit of information right now. We know that you're seeing the snarling dog, so we know that you are going to experience a, you know, a physiological response and a subjective feeling. However, let's bring that cognitive appraisal cognitive appraisal back into to factor here. <clears throat> is the snarling dog a, you know, a pit bull that's foaming out the mouth, that's standing right there, not on a leash, not behind a fence? That's going to lead to your body shaking tremendously. You're very scared. You're, you know, so the fear is, is very high. Or is that snarling dog behind a fence, a little, you know, uh, let's see, a little Yorkie dog behind a fence, and he's just barking, um, you know, at you. That might lead to a little bit of a physiological response and a little bit of fear, but you've appraised the situation as, oh, I'm going to be okay. That Yorkie is behind the fence. It's not going to hurt me tremendously. So the, the Lazarus's cognitive mediational theory looks at the level of emotion that you're going to be experiencing as well. <clears throat> so with, <clears throat> with all this talk about emotion, I want to um, say one last thing before we close. Um, research indicates that happiness does not necessarily depend on you know, keeping up with the Joneses or measuring yourself by someone else's yardstick. It doesn't necessarily depend on the acquisition of lots of things and stuff. Um, happiness actually depends on daily pleasures and the little things in life. And so I want you to reflect and um, just take a little bit of time this morning to reflect on some of the little daily pleasures that you experience. You know, so for some people that might be sitting out on the front porch and drinking coffee as the sun rise and rises and listens to the birds chirp. Um, for me, some of the daily pleasures that I experience, I still get excited whenever I get to go pick my daughter up from school, you know, to see her and get to ask her what, um, you know, to see her for the first time in eight hours and how her day went and things like that. Um, so I want you all to think about the little things in life and what might um, make you happy. Um, and really think about being real and not necessarily, you know, trying to um, measure yourself by someone else's yardstick or, you know, not comparing yourself to others, whether that's with money or status or even grades or athletic ability. Just know that each and every one of you are your own person. So I hope that each and every one of you would uh, be real with not only others, but with yourself as well. Okay, so that is chapter nine. On Thursday, we will be covering chapter 10. So we will meet every Tuesday and Thursday, or this Tuesday, today, Thursday, chapter 10. Next Thursday will be chapter 11, or Tuesday will be chapter 11. Next Thursday will be chapter 12, and then you can um, finish up unit four. Um, remember that your a unit three work or assignments are due by midnight Friday night. Okay, I want to um, remind you of something. Yes, it always falls in this way. Every weekend that assignments are due, we actually have a softball tournament. So after noon on Friday, I will be unavailable to answer your emails. 
So make sure that you get your work done early so that if you run into any situation that I can fix it before I leave to go to that softball tournament. So if you have any questions or comments, do not hesitate to email me. Um, I will be in my office today and Thursday. And uh, so I'm here, I'm, I'm on campus. If you need anything on the Cisco campus, or you can email me and I can get with you as soon as possible. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a good day.